Purple Daily is daily Vikings entertainment. We just want the Vikings to win a Super Bowl before we die. I will ride with this group. Seriously, man. Please. And away we go. Hello, football-loving friends. Uh-huh. This is Purple Daily. And it's Masters Week as well. I was well. to say, that was a little Nance in you. Yeah. Very oh. excited for Masters Week. Or the speaking hushed tones about azaleas. We should just undulate. It's huge now, means. though. Because of the live connection now, like we get to see everyone back together. I'm excited. I would say we should just talk about Michael Penix and Drake May in a nice whisper today. They yes. put him through a oh. private workout. Extensive yes. Bo Nix. Bo Nix. Spencer Rattler. Now to Drake May on 17. Back to Jaden Daniels. Over to Kayla Williams now. And Hello, here comes friends. Cool. And here comes Coy. <laughs> over to Sue. Oh, freezy. Sue. Over, over to, to Pominville. <laughs> to Granlin. Granlin. He scores. <laughs> Quarterback watch 2024 continues to be very juicy, and we have some more great nuggets. I have an exercise for us to go through. It's been a while since we've gone through this particular exercise, so we'll get to all of that. And a fun, I think it's a five-round mock that I stumbled into here. But a shout out to our friends at Fletcher Lake Lodge. If you are looking for a fun getaway later on this year, boy, do we have the place for you. Summer is coming, and guess what? That means it's time for some R&R, and Fletcher Lake Lodge is the perfect place of full-service fishing lodge located in beautiful Ontario, Canada. We get sued for using that music. We probably should. Only accessible by flying in on a traditional Canadian bush plane. Look at the fun right there. The remote setting ensures exceptional trophy fishing for guests. What am I talking about? I'm talking about trophy walleye. I'm talking about northern muskies, smallmouth bass. Cabins accommodate groups from 2 to 12. A a dock staff prepares your fully outfitted boat each morning. Jeannie and her staff, they're going to treat you like family. That's why so many people who uh, take in the Fletcher Lake Lodge experience return year after year. Visit FletcherLake.com to learn more about or book your reservation today. That's FletcherLake.com. There you see the gorgeous, the gorgeous Ontario, Canada setting of Fletcher Lake Lodge. Beautiful. So we're going to let's pluck a couple things here for Quarterback Watch 2024. I feel like we could use sounders for this. Quarterback Watch. Everybody hold your water. 2024. Uh, do you want to start with the Albert Breer, Michael Penix stuff or the general Viking stuff that he wrote about? Uh, let's start with the general Viking stuff and then okay. and then back into what, what was his lead, which I think was Penix. OK, so he this is Albert Breer from SI.com. And uh, and he wrote a big chunk yesterday about the Vikings approach to scouting these quarterbacks. I'm just going to read you a couple paragraphs. Sure. I really like the approach the Minnesota Vikings have taken to studying the quarterback class. Rather than go to cattle calls that pro days often become, Minnesota dispatched their quarterbacks coaches, Josh McCown and Grant Udinsky, to those cattle call pro days and then rolled out a larger contingent for the three-day whirlwind tour to work out quarterbacks privately. So they said, we'll go to pro days. We'll, We'll send McCown to a pro day. We don't care about the pro day as much. We want the private workout, and that's where we're going to bring many more people from the organization. So the itinerary included stops in Chapel Hill to meet Drake May, Ann Arbor to meet with J.J. McCarthy, Seattle to put Michael Penix through the paces, and Eugene, Oregon to see Bo Nix. I don't know that we've had that one reported yet, the Eugene to see Bo Nix. I didn't remember it. But that happened. In each case, the Minnesota contingent with Kwesi Adolfa Mensa, Kevin O'Connell, and Josh McCown heading up the traveling party had extensive meeting time with the quarterbacks before taking them out on the field. And then they would sort of, they'd like give them plays and stuff beforehand. They would test their retention and they would kind of have back and forth and and go through things. It's all very well thought out. It was rolled out really the minute Kirk Cousins decided to leave. The groundwork for the Houston trade was laid at the combine and pushed over the goal line after the ex-Vikings quarterback bolted for Atlanta. The smoking gun that getting a second first-round pick was done with the implicit goal to draft Cousins' replacement. The addition of Sam Darnold on a one-year deal sets a safety net. So I think the Bo Nix thing is new. So they've had private workouts 
where they like several hours where it's all of them. It's Quasi, it's Josh McCown, who is very, uh, very highly regarded. It's KOC. Now, Doogie gave us an update on the scoop session that Jaden Daniels is the only one here of these guys that are projected to maybe go in the top half of the first round that they haven't connected with on a private workout. And we kind of talked about, is that a smoke screen? Because Doogie's saying he's hearing from the Jaden Daniels side, no, they would love him to go to the Vikings if it worked out that way. They'd love him to probably go number two or three to the Vikings because they want that bigger uh, slot bonus. But um, Albert Breer, very, very high on the way the Vikings have approached this process. I absolutely, just from an outsider standpoint, and it's really good reporting by Breer, I love this. This is what I would want. This is where, in, in fact, my the train could come in by my oh, house. The train's coming my down the tracks. Bu- it's boxed in with a double. Hey, the Twins finally got a hit. It just happened here in SLP. It's the franchise quarterback train. And yep. you know what? We don't know who's on it. We yeah. don't know if it's McCarthy, if it's Penix. But you know what? He's, pull, he's pulling the thing right now, and it's coming down the tracks. Um, I love this. I think this is absolutely like if you were to ask me, hey, I'm going to get, give you scenarios of how teams like prepare to, to potentially draft a QB. This is great because what I complained about for so long with like Spielman and stuff was, you know, we get this guy in a room for 15 minutes at the combine and we get a lot. That's a lot of time that we can sit down. And I've always been like, okay, but you're sitting in a room and, and okay, the guy can get up to a chalkboard and draw plays or diagram plays that you discussed, but they're not on a field. And the pro days have become really sort of a, a tricked up way for quarterback to, to present th- themselves. A lot of them don't do things at the combine. So they do them at a pro day. That's basically been uh, presented by their people, right? It's their receivers. It's their patterns. It's their everything, which doesn't mean that they're a bad thing. But what Breer is saying with these personal workouts, I think this is what you want, which is alone time to talk about things, to get to know a person yeah. Cause like there's no as far as I know, there's no time constraint here now, right? So so like if I talk to Drake May at the combine, I literally am on an egg timer. And when it ends, he's done with me. <laughs> it, um yeah, if I talk yes. to him in Chapel Hill, I can talk to him in a environment that he's comfortable in, but more importantly, that we could probably talk for an hour in. Then we go to the field. So I can see him, you know, I, I think we get Because it's what we have access to. I think we get so hung up on the film that we often forget that, as we've discussed a thousand times, and it's incredibly important, the the quarterback should be the CEO of your team. So, like, if the CEO, if you hire a CEO of your company and he comes with a resume that's awesome, and he turns out to be a raging a-hole who no one can work for, but, like, he makes money, you still got some problems, so like this, this is the play-by-play of what I want, which is, and, and the, the McCallum thing I love because that gives you the ability to have somebody that you trust implicitly go to the pro days yeah. and also judge judge from that, which is great to see the guy around a big group. I, I am a huge fan of what I'm seeing because the decision is so huge and what this is explaining is it involves so much more than sitting down with film. Love it. Yeah, it, it Thor talked about, I think, two Thor's days ago about how this is like Bachelor and you're doing solo dates instead of group dates. You know, like it feels like the Vikings oh, yeah. could do speed dating with, you know, all these funny little combine visits and whatnot. Instead, like, no, 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 we want one on one time. You know, we want we want to get to know you a little bit. We're going to put you through this workout. We're going to we want to we want to see not just how you perform as a quarterback, but also how you perform as a CEO, as an individual. And I think that's kind of the right thing to do here. It is interesting, though, and we'll get to this Penix thing, that it just feels like in the last few weeks that the Michael Penix stock is on liftoff. And again, is that for good reason? Is that is he shooting up the draft board? Is that a smokescreen to kind of distract us from maybe a primary target? But it is interesting that Breer put on that that part about how they put him through a very rigorous workout and had him do numerous throws. Yeah, well, to to the you alluded to a couple a couple Thor's days ago, Thor brought up the Bachelor Bachelorette. I don't know. I'm, I've I've been a huge fan of those shows in terms of uh, you know smut TV going back ten years. 
And yeah, you like you you get a group date setting and there's all these teams and all these people and you're really only going to get the best version of people. If somebody acts out in that setting, it's probably a huge red flag. Uh, but everyone is putting on their best. But if you spend like two days with J.J. McCarthy or you spend eight or nine hours over the course of time, what you're really looking for is you kind of want to see what they look like when they're not at their best and they're not in a controlled environment. Like, I want to see it. What, how does a guy react when he doesn't comprehend the play call in the way that you wanted or he misses a throw or something? Because you're going to make mistakes. You're going to, you know, you're a human being. Does he lash out? Does he get weird? Does he get defensive? Does he not take the blame? Is he not comfortable with feedback? Like those are all things that you don't really get to learn at the combine or in your little 15 minutes where you get to ask him weird questions about their family history and stuff, right? So, so okay, let's get to the panic stuff from this Albert Breer article because it is interesting. Now, he does lay out one of the themes here is that it's possible that it's not Penix's draft stock rising, that it's just – the more information comes out, the more we're seeing the merging of what the NFL world thinks about Penix versus where the media and mock drafters have. And it's probably less about teams realizing, oh, my God, Michael Penix is a good quarterback prospect. And it's like the public is getting the actual information. Yep. So the Vikings did send a large contingent to Seattle. They put him through a workout of nearly 100 throws. So think about that. I mean, that's mm -hmm. like probably two hours worth of throwing footballs right there. Um, assuming that you're taking some breaks here and there. But I'm going to read you some snippets here from different sources that Breer talked to about Penix. From one offensive coach from an AFC team, quote, Penix is my number two guy. I love Penix. He's a stud, a born leader, calm and collected in a genuine way. He's a baller. He turns it loose. He can throw into tight windows. He stands in the pocket. He lets plays develop. He takes hits. He throws it down the field. He's just a winner. Here's an AFC uh, college scouting director who says about Penix. He has a super strong arm. Combined with running faster than most people thought, he's just had a really good day talking about his pro day. On top of that, he comes off as a humble, confident, introspective guy in meetings with teams after a six-year, two-school college career. He's much more mature than maybe some of the other guys. And so uh, Breer checked in with a couple people to see what was the disconnect between, you know, some of the opinions on Michael Penix. The strongest answer I got was easy to understand. Simply put, Penix has things you can't coach. Um, actually, so he said there's a disconnect between teachers and evaluators. So, yep. like, coaches, scouts. coaches yep. and scouts. Yep. The strongest answer I got was was easy to understand. Simply put, Penix has things you can't coach. The deep ball accuracy is off the charts. He throws with anticipation. He's as tough as nails. He's football smart. So where a scout looks at the sometimes scattershot accuracy underneath and some issues with movement throughout the pocket, the coach looks at what he can coach and what he can't and believes he can fill in the blanks thereafter. So what basically to sum this up, coaches say – we can fix the footwork. That's not a problem. We fixed Aaron Rodgers mechanics 20 years ago. We fixed Patrick Mahomes mechanics, you know, eight years ago. We can fix the mechanics. Right. You can't teach maturity. You can't teach being tough as nails. You can't teach gravitational pull that teammates, you know, want to take a bullet on the football field for you. That, that Michael Penix has some of those qualities that are just not teachable. Yes. The more I read, the more I'm totally cool with the Vikings drafting Michael Penix 11th, by the way. just That's kind of where I'm at after reading this Me too. article. <laughs> well, and it sounds like, I, I think what he's tr trying to say, too, is the football talents that he does possess. Like, like you can't teach a big arm. Like, you can't teach. There, mm -hmm. there are certain things that you can't teach. There are certain things that, that you can. And you, you right. always have to be somewhat concerned of the old philosophy of, I can fix the problem. And then it's like, oh, whoops, I really couldn't fix the problem. But where I where I come back on this one is, I think what's dropped the perception and and what now is being I think pushed back against a, a little bit too, and it's the thing we don't know, the medicals, the knees. Like, are, are they fine? Did they come back fine? Are there red flags? Like that that's something I expect to to get out like the week of the draft if teams are trying to scare teams off and things yeah. like that. But that to me is the biggest thing. 
But I, I think that this one is really, really intriguing because Michael Penix probably will be drafted somewhere around where, where we, we were talking about around the time of the national championship game, right? Like, I, I think if the Vikings like him as much as they possibly might and, and they stay at 11, they're probably going to take him there. But, you know, this all comes down to, and this is why O'Connell and is, is so important here, this all comes down to so many judgments that have to be made by a person who understands what they're watching. And I don't know, like, we all like to think, oh, we know football, right? But the quarterback position is such a unique position. O'Connell played there. He gets things that I'm sorry, Rick Spielman's of the world simply aren't going to get. Well, this this last paragraph here that I'll read to you guys, this is the key to what you just said. Kevin O'Connell's judgment of Michael Penix. And and you could play this game with all the, all the quarterbacks in question. This article sure. happens to be about Penix. Sure. But O'Connell's system lives in that intermediate range, crossing routes, a lot of like 10, 15 yard in the air passes. It's less about airing it down the field 40 yards, although there are some of those too. So Breer said, I did have one NFC executive call Penix a three-point shooter before the Washington-Michigan title game. Two others I talked to agreed with that assessment that, yeah, he's like he's a three-point shooter, and that's that's kind of it. Then I watched the championship games, and I saw Wolverine's defensive coordinator, Jesse Minter, dare Penix to beat Michigan underneath and go on 10, 12, 14 play drives, and Washington couldn't pull it off. The optimist, coaches, would say that that can be fixed with some mechanical work. He could be just better at dissecting in that short intermediate range. The pessimist, scouts in this case, would say that he's been in school for six years, he's had great coaching, why isn't he better in the intermediate range going into the NFL? Right. It's not like folks haven't been trying to coach him in that regard. Right. So that, I mean, that's something that idiots on microphones like us can't figure out that that is a Kevin O'Connell specific question that you would or Josh McCown and you'd say guys can you get him to be more accurate and more surgical in these little these jab passes that you need to to sustain these 8 10 12 play drives right and and the answer can't be just like yeah we can i i think it goes into here's exactly how we can do it right like i under like these guys will understand exactly what the fundamentals are. Now, here's the thing with Penix that I think we have have to be prepared for. And this is not a bad thing, but I don't think we're prepared for it yet. I think if they take a guy like Penix, we have to be prepared for Sam Darnold to start all of 2024. Because you think so? Yeah, well, I'm just saying, if you're going to redo the mechanics, the worst thing that you can do is play a guy. Because he's going to revert. Sure. I mean, we saw this with Tebow. We have we've we have seen this countless times. I work with you in training camp. Like, off-season, we work. Training camp, we work. Four weeks in, Sam Darnold's not playing awful, but he ain't great. And so I'm like, Michael Penix is going to play. What happens? He reverts back. Like, it's too quick. Michael, like, we've, we've spent the entire off-season teaching you how to throw right-handed. Yeah. Okay. And now, exactly. you're, now you're trying to throw left hand again, guy. <laughs> and your brain just goes back to what you know. So, so like now the bullets are flying, and now you're like back into your ha- into your habits. I think you have to be prepared for. But if you spend an entire season working on things, you literally have to rewire the brain. If they were to draft total side question, total like let's say they draft Michael Penix, would you give left handed quarterback? Would you still give Christian Derrissaw a top of the market left tackle contract? This is such yes. A good, this is such a good. This is uh, this is a great. Yeah. One. Would you? Yes. I gotta think. I gotta think on it. Sorry. What if I some team says we'll give you two first round picks for your your non oh, not not as essential tackle position because he's not protecting the quarterback's blind side anymore? Yeah, I mean, I well, two oh, first God. round picks. I mean, that that's definitely enticing. But let's also <laughs> be honest, though. Like they have Brian O'Neill, who's a right tackle, but he's older. And I'm not mm-hmm. saying like tackles just erode once they get into once they get 29, 30. But he's got but, he's had an Achilles like it's a, it's a valid point. Yeah, he's yeah, older. Yeah. Christian Derrissaw, I think is uh, Brian O'Neill's a good tackle. I think Christian Derrissaw is more on an elite level, even a better player than than Brian O'Neill. Mm-hmm. I think taking out a humongous foundational block. We talk about a rookie quarterback being successful in this offense, and then you're just going to remove one of the biggest clubs out of your bag. I don't. I wouldn't say that would be the smartest thing to do. Would you consider 
long term moving Christian Derisaw with a new contract to right tackle. Right tackle. So this is this would be a conversation with Christian and his representation for a couple things. Mechanically, would he do it? Correct, and that's like, a big question. Could he do it? But also, if you're big him. Question. Left tackles get paid a lot more than not a lot, but like they get paid millions yeah. more than right tackles. Mm -hmm. If it with a with a right handed quarterback, right? I'd say my client would happily move to right tackle. Oh, I'd pay him left tackle only money. after you pay him blindside 100%. tackle money. Yeah, no, I'm saying that's that, that's exactly okay. what. Would would you sign him to a left tackle contract to play right tackle because the quarterback if he is can do left handed? It, if he feels like it's. We think like, oh, whatever. They just it's not. Like if he's been playing no, left tackle difficult. mechanically his whole career, it's difficult. this is a question for Booney and Jeremiah. Say, yeah. Like yep. Yep. But it's uh yeah, I don't think you're just looking to get rid of one of your best players, but it does kind of change the dynamics. So, okay, here's another just to dovetail this. We in the past, I think we've done this exercise for two or three years when it was a conversation. Are they going to maybe draft a quarterback to replace Kirk Cousins? You know, he's got one year left on his deal or whatever. Uh, and so we've done the exercise of what is the percentage chance that your drafted quarterback pans out based on the slot they were taken? First quarterback taken, second quarterback taken. And, and we have traditionally defined panning out as just being an above average quarterback for multiple seasons. So... Um, like Derek Carr, not a superstar, but Derek Carr was an above average quarterback for multiple seasons. He would count as panning out. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm trying to think of other like borderline examples like Carson Wentz before the Carson Wentz technically panned out because he was an MVP candidate for a year. Like he had three good years, you know, injury kind of derailed him. And so this is really interesting when you start to look at First slot, second slot, third quarterback taken, fourth quarterback taken, the last 25 years going back to 2000. And it's a little subjective because I'm taking some liberties with like what I think panned out means with some quarterbacks. But if you are the first quarterback taken off the board, whether you're the first overall pick or whether that first quarterback goes third, if you're the first quarterback taken off the board since the year 2000, it's like a 65% success rate. Like two thirds of those guys pan out to be above average quarterbacks. Okay. And if you're getting an above average quarterback on a rookie scale contract for four or five years, that is a huge win for your franchise, right? That is definitely. Yeah. Now you can build a team. You know, you got you got flexibility. There's a huge drop after the first quarterback off the board. Okay. If you're the second quarterback off the board. And I can go through some of these names, by the way, but it's like a 38 to 40% hit rate. Mm -hmm. Third quarterback off the board, just under 30% hit rate. Fourth quarterback off the board has been really bad. It's been a 14% hit rate. Wow. And that counts Jordan Love. It counts Derek Carr. He was a second round pick, obviously. Yep. Uh, fifth quarterback off the board is a 32% hit rate above right. average for multiple seasons. Now, as Doogie pointed out on the scoop session today, every year has to be treated differently. Like if you go back to the year 2000, there was only one quarterback drafted in the first round. So the, the, the talent wasn't nearly as good in the year 2000 compared to like 2004, where you had Eli, Philip Rivers, Ben Roethlisberger, Matt Schaub was like a third round pick or something in that draft. Right. So, if the Vikings get the fourth or fifth quarterback off the board, history would tell you there's only like a 20, maybe 25 to 30% chance that that guy becomes a multi-year above average starter. But this year also might be one of the top three strongest classes of the last 25 years. So maybe you should be a little bit less, right. um, you know, because glued the slots to these numbers. Too. Cause like in, in right, like, a yes. down year, the fourth QB is taken in like the third round. Correct. A hundred percent. And this yep. time it's, it's going to probably be top or it's going to be top 10. Yeah. Probably. Like 2007, the first oh. quarterback off the board was number one overall, Jamarcus Russell. The second quarterback off the board was 22nd Brady Quinn. And then uh, Kevin Cobb, John Beck and Drew Stanton in like the second, third rounds. Oh. Cause it wasn't as good of a class. Yep. Wasn't Declan a Kevin Cobb Stan? Big Kevin Cobb Stan. <laughs> You pick what, but Big Drew Locke. You, you've been a Drew Locke stand. You've been a Kevin yeah. Cobb stand. Like, I like mean, you, pick, you don't win the quarterback cesspool challenge, like the reigning defended undisputed champion I am, without knowing bad quarterbacks. <laughs> well, not for the playoffs, you're not. But right. I mean, the, the regular season 
Congratulations. No, the tournament, that's fine, yeah. Yeah, yeah, when it comes to the tournament, we're talking a different story right there, but that's fine. No, that's, uh, yeah, Kevin Cobb. Kevin Cobb, Philadelphia, right? Philadelphia. Philadelphia, uh, Arizona, Arizona. <laughs> Buffalo. Guys, I've got, I was we should do an immaculate grid, Kevin Cobb. I, I, was, I was fine with that. But, so, I mean, I guess like, I would sum this up by saying two things. When you're not taking the first quarterback off the board, which is, you know, hey, you get your pick of all these guys, who is it? Right. The league is the league is hitting like 65, 70% first quarterback off the board. Second, third, fourth, fifth, you have like a one in three chance historically the last 25 years of that guy being a, a multi-year above average starter. But I think in this year's class, you would notch those numbers up because of just how talented the arms are in this class. So something to chew on, I guess, as we as we go through this process. Yeah, I feel pretty good about this one. Like I I feel like this is not now now I guess you can go back to and and I don't expect this, but who knows? You can go back to what was it, two thousand the ponder year, two thousand twelve. Cause I mean there there were a lot of first round QBs mm. in that draft. Yeah. And Cam Newton panned out pretty damn well. And beyond that, I think it was it was really bad. So like, have, like actually, yeah, I've got that. I've got the the 2011 the draft. It was Newton, 11. Jake Locker, Blaine Gabbert, Christian Ponder, Andy Blake. Dalton, and Colin. Wasn't Colin Kaepernick also a second round pick? Second in, round pick. That is correct. That yep. So that's that was actually a pretty deep, talented quarterback class. That's what yeah. I'm saying. And then it. But there was a couple landmines in there that you're looking to. Now were were a couple of those situations. Again, I don't know. Like, if Blaine Gabbert gets drafted, wasn't he, like, who drafted him? Was it the... Jags. Jaguars? Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah, and Blaine Gabbert had been, I believe when that draft process started, like, the previous fall, he, he was perceived as the top overall pick. Yeah. Wasn't there that awful game, too, Judd, you covered? It was, like, Vikings-Jags week two. I think, actually, when Ponder became the full-time, it was just, like, a slugfest of 13-10 to 10 in overtime. It was just yeah. two sophomore quarterbacks. Like, oh, they're going to lead their franchises, and it was just a grind of a football game. Yeah. yeah. and But this is – and I, we can't go back and play this out, but mm -hmm. Blaine Gabbert – or let's use this year's examples, okay? The New England Patriots drafting any of these quarterbacks, that quarterback has a lower percentage chance of panning out long-term. Yes, Drafted by this version of the Patriots because they have no weapons. They have a defensive head coach. Yes. They're in complete train wreck mode as an organization. That I would venture to say whoever gets drafted by the Patriots has a far less percentage to pan out than whoever gets drafted by the Vikings, who have one of the best infrastructures That's of the thing, any yeah. team in the NFL for a quarterback. And I, I think this is among the most intriguing conversations of this entire process because of, of this. So the bears, I'm not a huge fan of their coach, but I think that their infrastructure has improved. Like, like if Caleb is not being sent in to fail, I don't think like he's got, he's going to have receivers. That team's improving. If I'm Jaden Daniels and yeah, it's great to be taken second, but am I very confident in, in, you know, Dan Quinn who did a, Decent job in Atlanta, but he's still a defensive first guy. That for, you know, I think that yeah. franchise is going to improve, but they're not there yet, really. You brought up the Patriots. I see that as a complete dumpster fire. Like that to me is a recipe to lose and not lose in a good way. I mean, lose your yeah. career. So, like, you look at those top teams, and I, I would sign off on the Bears. After that, if I am a representative for, you know, Jaden Daniels, a Drake May, um, McCarthy, man, those top, you know, the top five, or I, I should say the top two, the top two, then Washington and the Patriots, the Cardinals will, will pass. But I mean, I don't like any of those franchises right now, at least. That's where those, those franchises are looking for someone to save their Correct. sorry ass franchise. <laughs> Correct. It's just true. Yeah. Please, Jaden Daniels, it's a, save our train wreck franchise from the depths of despair. It's a serial dater. It's a serial dater. And 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 they're going to, you know, it's going to be great for a week. And then you're going to be like, you are a dumpster fire. Yeah. It, it, it's a serial dater that's rushing into things way too quickly. Too. Correct. It, it's it's not just a serial. Correct. It's like, I'm, I'm in love after get... the first date. It's like, oh, this yeah. person's nuts It's love by is blind. Four. It's that Netflix yeah. show. Yep. Love yeah. is blind. Oh, yeah, let's get married. It's great. Yeah. Oh, I didn't like, know you look like that. Oh, it's nah. Nah. <laughs> Oh, the lights are on. <laughs> Actually, you know what? The Patriots, they're catfishing you. They're not even a football team. <laughs>
we're the Patriots. This is our this is our picture from 20 years ago. Look yeah. at how many Super Bowls <laughs> look at, we have. Look at, look it's actually a guy hand. named Judd. You know, it's just yeah. yeah. Yep, yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's a guy. Yep. This is our this is our Hall of Fame quarterback. He's unbelievable. Look at how handsome he is. That picture is really old. Yeah, okay, that's um, whatever. <laughs> You know, uh, if you show a picture of Finch Home Solutions, it's really, uh, they're always looking at their best at Finch Home Solutions. Yep, exactly. And look at that right there. They're de- they're being dispatched left and right. You know why? Because Finch Home Solutions, my friend Cody and his team, they have the answers, not to your quarterback situation, but to your electrical situation at your home. They're going to protect your home. They're going to protect your your family. They're going to make sure that your home is safe. Upgrades to current systems, electrical servicing, repairing storm damage, breakers, tripping, flickering lights, big or small. Guess what? Finch, fast, courteous, and incredibly efficient. Finch Home Solutions. Give them a call. 612-357-2604. 612-357-2604 or finchhomesolutions.com. Cody and his team will take care of, of your home. And they would also love to talk some purple because I don't know a bigger Vikings fan than Cody. Finchhomesolutions.com. Dex, tell them about Aquaside for these upcoming lake months in and around uh, the upper Midwest. God, I, I got word that... um. That at, a, at the cabin in Shell Lake on the in-laws, they got the dock in already. They put the waders on. They just put that Let's dock go. in already. Let's and uh, luckily at that lake in Shell Lake, Wisconsin, there that, that is an aquaside lake, as I like to call it. There, there's none of that weeds and algae, that nasty muck that's at the bottom of, of your lake. So if you're trying to figure out what is even under there, you can call your call our friends at Aquaside, and they'll help you diagnose what that is. They have the aquaside pellets, helps you get rid of whatever that is in there. And also, it's a safe product. It's registered with the EPA and DNR. You can go to Aquaside.com. Shipping is free with these products, too. Go to Aquaside.com to learn more. Hey, a couple notes on the draft party before we get to a mock. And also, I know we, we there was a Justin Jefferson talker we were going to get to. Let's save that for maybe tomorrow. The call is coming from inside the house, I feel like. Some Justin Jefferson steam. But we'll get to that on tomorrow's show. Do some more what? digging. You're scaring me. Yeah, no, it's, it's an, it, something interesting came out, but it's, we, let's, let's see if we can get some more intel, do it tomorrow. Um, but uh, the Purple Daily Draft Party, I just want to say, there, apparently there's like a, a fake poser ticket site on Eventbrite. If, if our, this event is sold out completely, there are no tickets available for the Purple Daily Draft Party. So if you have stumbled into a website where it says VIP tickets, we have reported it. Do not purchase tickets from the poser fake website. I uh, just a couple people sent in notes yesterday saying that there's like a scammer site. Um, if so, again, the score North Pur- Pur- purple Dilly draft party is sold out. So Judd, don't get duped on I, the internet. Okay. I bought four yesterday. <laughs> no, that thousand are, bucks a piece. You got scammed. I think. No. So, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I, I, it sucks that that type of thing happens, but um, just do not, do not engage with the scammers. A shout out, by the way, to our friends at Popcorn of Minnetonka, the official flag sponsor of the Purple Daily Draft Party at the Fillmore on April 25th. Everyone in attendance gets a Purple Daily flag courtesy of Popcorn, and the VIPs get a popcorn sample bag. And uh, Crybaby Craig's Gourmet Hot Sauce. Did I shout them out already this week? If not, uh, a shout out to Crybaby Craig's. And also uh, Northern Fire Grilling and Barbecue Supply is uh, is providing the hot takes station <laughs> on stage for us at the Fillmore. So be great. we're pumped for uh, Northern right. Fire Grilling and Barbecue Supply. Let's see, five tickets to the draft party? Nope, nope. 2,000 feet? Mock. Nope. Mock. All right, boys. This is from Chad Reuter of NFL.com, and it's a five-round mock draft. Chad Lee. Chad Reuter. Not messing around. Or Chad Reuter, Reuter, whatever. I don't know how to pronounce his name. And he does Chad. have trades. Oh, there's trades. Nice work. Nice work, Chadley. Is he doing trades in every round, though? That's yeah, I want to see guys who like commit to the trades where you're you're pulling like 15 trades in the fifth round, seventh round picks. So he's got the Bears taking Caleb Williams, Commanders taking Jaden Daniels, Patriots taking Drake May, and then we have a trade. Where the Denver Broncos are now on the clock at number four. And they take J.J. McCarthy. So if, if this happens, which is very feasible, the top three teams could say, close for business. We're taking our franchise quarterback. Yep. And the Broncos could say, 
we'll just sell everything because we are desperate again for a quarterback after the Russell Wilson debacle. Yep. And the Vikings get frozen out. So this is Sean Payton giving up first and third round picks in 2025. So it's it's a, a first round pick swap this year, next year's first, and then a third, which seems like less of a cost than the Vikings giving up the 11 to 23 and maybe a third. But yeah, I think if that was the if that was the return to the Cardinals. I would question what the Vikings didn't do. Yeah. A little bit. Wouldn't you? Uh, yeah. I mean, well, that's this is where you know how I feel about this. If they love Penix and they feel like they can get Penix sure. at 11, cool. Hang on to your picks. I'll ride with Penix. But, I mean, that, that return does not seem like a ridiculous request by the Cardinals. No. But if you, like, this is the, the we keep coming back to this. You're a coward if you don't trade up. Okay, what if, after all these evaluations and everything we just read about Penix, the Vikings love J.J. McCarthy, and they love Michael Penix. Yeah. They love both those guys. Yeah. But to get McCarthy, you'd have to go up, you know, eight slots or whatever, six yeah. slots, seven slots, and give up future picks. It, it would be stupid to do that if you're the Vikings, and you also like Michael Penix. So, What if I was to offer on draft night, instead of being at the Fillmore, my services as a mediator in the draft room? So I can look in O'Connell's eyes and I can know what he wants. And 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 if he Don't get cute. And if Quasi's like, okay, yeah, no, no, we gotta do this and we gotta and I'm like, hold on, whoa, 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 Quasi. What does Kevin think? What does Kevin want? Kevin, Kevin, speak up. Yeah. I mean, I think I think Quasi is gonna I think he's gonna do what Kevin wants him to do because it's quarterback, right? Like with and the receiver year, thing, yeah. he's like, listen. Quasi's like, it. we can get receivers. Kevin's like, no, 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 I want I want this receiver. I think with quarterback, I think it's gonna be he did listen Kevin's last show. year. He did listen yeah. last year. So that was when good. um when my dad was in the kitchen, my dad was a really good chef, and so he would have all, all, all these great meals if there was a family dinner going on. But he had in a famous line was stay the hell out of my kitchen. Yeah, like as in right. get the hell out of the way. Don't don't get in my way. That's okay. what I would feel like being around Kevin O'Connell on draft. Like I don't want to be near that guy. That guy is cooking and that guy is working. The last thing I want to do is being ske- uh, being yelled at by someone who's trying to cook. Last thing I want to do. So Chargers take Marvin Harrison Jr. five. Giants take Malik Neighbors at six. Titans take Joe Alt seven. Cardinals okay. get the third. So the Cardinals get a hall of picks and they still get Roma Dunce with the eighth overall picks. Not a bad yes. deal for them. I love that idea, though. So they move. They moved up. They went down to twelve, and then back up to eight. By the way, they trade with the. Awesome for it, man. He's the... just working the phones all, all, yep. all the time. So Bears take Dallas Turner. Yep. Jets get Brock Bowers, and then on the clock at eleven, the Minnesota Vikings, and they select out of the University of Texas defensive tackle Byron Murphy the second. Mm-hmm. Minnesota goes for an impact defender with the first of their uh, two first-round picks, choosing Murphy over edge Jared Verse. He's a coveted player. He can attack quarterbacks in the interior, which is what they need. Jared Verse, edge rusher to the Falcons. And then there's a run on offensive tackles here in the middle. You got the Eagles trading up for the Duke center, Graham Barton, to replace Jason Kelsey. Chiefs trading up to get Xavier Worthy, the speedy Texas wide receiver at 17. Ooh, Brian crazy. Thomas, receiver to the Bengals. So a little, little Chop Robinson, edge rusher to the Rams. And then here's the Vikings back on the clock with the 23rd overall pick. Where history repeats itself with the Vikings matching their 2014 draft plan, taking a defensive player with their top pick in the first round and then snagging a quarterback later in round one out of the University of Oregon. Bo Nix to the Vikings. I saw it. Yeah, 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 that's great. Wow, dude. People would be pissed, but you know what? If at the end of the day, if Kevin O'Connell said, that's my guy, I don't know how you can fight it. Like I, he would have so much more information, and Josh McCown would have a say in that. Who did the so, Raiders take? Let's see here. Let me go back because I want to go through the other rounds quick, and then we gotta we oh, gotta record sure. with. Uh, by the way, cheap plug: flagrant howls on fire these days. If you're a Timberwolves fan, and the Score North Twin Show with Trevor Plouffe Tuesdays, also Judd's Hockey Show. Check out the other podcast. But um, the Raiders are taking. J.C. Latham, the Alabama offensive tackle. 
in this scenario. So the fourth round, I'm just curious what he has here. He's got the 108. He's got what? No way, dude. With the 108th overall pick. Yeah. <laughs> By the way, Spencer Rattler goes 107 to the Giants. The Minnesota Vikings select Arkansas kicker Cam Little. <laughs> A fourth round kicker. Wow. <laughs> okay, that's wild. Yeah, I don't. Okay. And then with Chad, the Chad, 129, Chad, they Chad, take Chad, Chad. Boston College offensive guard Christian Mahogany. 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 And then in the fifth round, so literally with their third pick in the draft, they take a kicker. Yeah. No. And then in the fifth round, he's got the Vikings taking with the 157. Oh, Javon Baker, the wide receiver. Oh, a Thor's Thor was Day. talking about. A yeah. Thor's Day staple. Nice. And then Braden McGregor, the edge rusher from Michigan. With their other fifth round. I pass. want a mock. Mock. Interesting. Yeah. Kicker. Wow, dude. A kicker. Bo Nix and a kicker. Oh, man. People would freak if that I happened. I would have to take a sabbatical from the show. <sighs> <laughs> no, you wouldn't. Take you, would, you, would, you would love to rip them to shreds. Okay, then then we would have to go dude. Uh, score north F after dark so I could drop <laughs> the amount of F-bombs I wanted. <laughs> Be wild, man. Oh, God. Okay, a shout out to our friends at Federated Mutual Insurance Company. As a business owner, you understand the importance of protecting your reputation, your workplace, your employees, your financial assets. And there's business owners who consume this show. We've heard from you. Our team at Federated is ready to help your team by creating a custom lineup of industry-specific coverages and risk management services to help you stay on top of your game. Contact your local Federated rep for more information today. Federated Insurance, it's our business to protect yours, go to federatedinsurance.com. All right. Wow, we got mm. write that down predictions tomorrow. Another Thor's Day coming up in 48 hours. And uh, plenty more quarterback watch 2024 here on Purple Daily, where we just want the Vikings to win a Super Bowl before we die. <laughs>